Now, tomorrow marks uh, two years since Kabul fell to the Taliban after Western troops withdrew from Afghanistan. The UK's ambassador to the country at the time, Sir Laurie Bristow, stayed behind at Kabul airport for two weeks to help evacuation efforts. He personally helped process the visa applications of thousands of uh, the British and the Afghan nationals who were then airlifted to safety. And Sir Laurie Bristow joins me now, um, good evening and thank you very much for being with us. And first of all, as I say, you lived through the danger, the violence, that dramatic couple of weeks. When you look back, what are your thoughts about that chaotic evacuation? It was a, a pretty terrible time for everybody concerned. Um, but just to recap, you know, we, uh, we'd been in Afghanistan for 20 years um, in response to the attacks of 9-11 of 2001 to try to address a very serious security threat to the United States and uh, to the UK. Um, and um, that was not the way that anybody wanted it to end. I think, though, looking back on it, the thing that um, we should still be very proud of um, is the way that our military and our diplomats and our Home Office staff um, you know, conducted that evacuation under appalling conditions um, in that terrible two weeks at the end um, and got out 15,000 people um, who would otherwise have been um, at mortal risk from the Taliban. Uh, do you think it uh, you know, had to be like that? Do you think the Americans, who certainly had the power there, um, could have handled it better? You know, they left just very suddenly. Yeah. So the... I think that looking back on it, the, uh, the mistakes that we made over 20 years really come down to not preparing effectively uh, the kind of Afghan state that will be able to stand on its own two feet when foreign military forces left. When the plan was never that we should be there in perpetuity, uh, in, at least in terms of the military presence. Uh, that, of course, wasn't what happened. Um, the state wasn't strong enough to withstand the Taliban onslaught. The military weren't strong enough to withstand the Taliban onslaught. I think the, the biggest mistake of all, though, um, was um, the, the Doha deal between the Trump administration um, and the Taliban, which essentially set a timetable um, for international forces to leave, but without putting any serious conditions um, on the Taliban uh, for that to happen. Um, and of course, after the US election, um, that timetable for the military withdrawal uh, was confirmed by the Biden administration. And um, as the, the military withdrawal happened, of course, things went very, very bad very, very quickly on the battlefield. Right, now, but we are where we are. So, you know, two years on, the Taliban still in power. Doesn't look like they're going to go anywhere. Not a single country has formally recognised their rule. Is it right, do you think, to isolate them like that, given what we'll go on to talk about, which is what has happened in Afghanistan in the two years? Yeah. So two years ago, there was a, a degree of speculation, um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure on what basis, what evidence, um, that somehow the Taliban had reformed um, in their 20 years out of power. I never saw any real evidence for that, and I think what we've seen since um, is that um, those hopes were unfounded. Um, there are some signs of disagreement between the more fundamentalist elements of the Taliban and those who might take a more pragmatic approach. But at the moment, I think what we're seeing um, is a Taliban who are every bit as repressive as we feared they would be. Um, so, you know, we need to be clear about who these people are and what they represent. They fought their way to power. They overthrew the internationally recognised government that we'd all supported and which we'd invested so much. 457 British soldiers, unfortunately, lost their lives in that war. Thousands of Afghans lost their lives in that war. So the, the question now is, as, as you say, what do we do with the reality that we have? I mean, in terms of the question around engagement or recognition, nobody, of course, is going to recognize the Taliban government anytime soon for the reasons I described. But there's a difference between recognition and engagement. So in, in my 32 years in the Foreign Office, I spent quite a lot of my time talking to people who vehemently disagreed with us, who in many cases didn't even like us. And that's really not the point. Um, you, know, you don't talk to um, people in charge of a foreign country necessarily because you like them, but because you have interests. And I think the next thing that we need to do is to work out what our interests are and how the balance of engagement versus not engagement helps us to pursue those. And of course, not engagement, engaging with the Taliban is always an option, but it may not necessarily be a very good one. Engagement at what level, do you think? Yeah. So we've, uh, we've had, the UK government has had for some time a pragmatic engagement, a pragmatic channel of dialogue with the Taliban. 
um, first with the political commission in Doha, um, and of course since they uh, they overthrew the government um, in um, in Kabul. Um, I don't think it's the right time for us to be talking about establishing an embassy there, and that of course is um, something that um, was under consideration, is under consideration, um, and certainly I don't think it's um, a, a situation where we would wish to give the Taliban the, the credibility, the prestige of engaging with them at very senior levels. But we do need to engage on the things that matter to us. And I think for me, they boil down to about three interrelated questions. Um, one is the humanitarian crisis. I mean, this is a country where the majority of the population um, are in dire humanitarian need. Um, second, it's about security. Um, you know, going back to what I said earlier, the fact that we went into Afghanistan 22 years ago to address a major security threat. Al Qaeda are still present. Islamic State is still present um, in um, Afghanistan. Um, and the third is, um, I think it's around the the longer term development consequences um, of what the Taliban are doing um, to women and girls. And I think the three things are linked. And if you wanted to describe what a state from which bad things for us would come, um, a state where there is a humanitarian disaster, um, you know, we don't have visibility of security threats, and half the population are being essentially driven out of public life and out of education. That's a pretty toxic mix. Right. Right, well, that's the point. I mean, the Taliban tightening the laws on women and girls, not easing them, cracking down on their rights. The sanctions that the West's imposing, you know, there's widespread hunger there. Um, according to the UN, 84% of households are borrowing money just to buy food. So there's these two questions, really. It, what, you know, how do we engage or can we engage with them and get them to change their mind on this aspect of women and girls? Or is isolating them the best way to get them to change their mind? It's a difficult choice. Yeah, so that, that really is the dilemma for all of us, not just the UK, but the wider international community, and pretty much all of the international community. Um, and uh, the, 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 the dilemma we have here is that we don't want to support the Taliban, but we do want to support the people of Afghanistan. Um, there are, we need to find ways to do this effectively. The United, the United Nations system are still active there. They're managing to work under not ideal conditions with the Taliban. Um, you know, there's not much disagreement um, internationally about the size and shape of the problem. We need to be clear, this is going to be a really, really long, hard haul. I mean, this was not the way it was meant to be. Is there a sense, do you think, that after 20 years of war and attempts at rebuilding, and we have to say girls going to school and women going to universities, that we have in the end let down the people of Afghanistan? There are certainly, I think, people who would describe it that way. Um, and um, one very important point here, you know, we need to listen, we need to hear the voices of Afghans um, in this discussion, particularly Afghan women. Um, you know, there are plenty of uh, things that they have to say and not many spaces for them to say it. What I would come back to here, though, are what are our interests? Our interests uh, do not allow us to walk away from this problem. You know, if, if we find ourselves again in a situation where a failed or failing state in Afghanistan is harboring violent extremists who want to attack us or our allies, um, where th those extremist views are hardwired in through gender apartheid, and where the population, large numbers of people are trying to leave, turning up maybe in small boats on the, ch of the channel, that's a problem for us. And we need to find ways, imperfect, difficult though they'll be, uh, to address those problems. And just finally, um, you mentioned, you know, the coming across on Afghanistan, still waiting to be processed. Three and a half thousand families who are approved, still stuck in Afghanistan. Are we being much too slow um, in getting the people out who need to be out? Well, we got 15,000 people out in, two, in the two weeks of Operation Pitting. Uh, we've got another nearly 10,000 out. The UK government has got another nearly 10,000 out shortly before and since the end of Operation Pitting. But I think it's probably a good time to step back a little bit and um, ask ourselves you know, those, those rather broader questions. Why is it that people feel they need to let, leave Afghanistan? It's because there's nothing there for them. You know, their, their lives are a threat in some cases. Um, my personal view um, is that we need to remind ourselves that um, in the case of certainly the people who worked with us, um, worked for us as military interpreters or as staff in the embassy or worked alongside us 
um, in prosecuting counterterrorism cases in Afghanistan. Um, you know, that we have an obligation to them as a nation. They were trying to achieve the same things that we were trying to achieve, and their lives are at risk as a result of working with the UK and our allies. Um, now, obviously, we can't take everybody from Afghanistan. There is an enormous amount of need in Afghanistan, in the world more widely. But I think there's also a question here about um, you know, how, who are the people with the strongest case to be brought to the UK? That's surely the people whose lives are at risk because they worked with us. But also, how do we work effectively, more effectively, with international partners to address a global migration problem? But, and just, but I mean, there are those who have, you know, were working for British forces, have their, um, you know, their applications to leave approved and they're still there. I mean, that, something surely has to be done about them and quickly. I, I agree. I, I think we owe those people a, a, a um, uh, we, we owe it to those people to help them. Uh, we need to find ways to do it. It is happening. Um, my view, though, is that you know we need to remind ourselves of the importance of it happening, but also happening quickly. There's no point in trying to help somebody when they've been killed. Laurie Bristow, um, look, it, we could go on for for another half an hour, but it's uh, it's good of you to come on uh, this week. Thank you very much indeed.